Welcome to our study of advanced machine learning tools for engineers and in this segment we're going to look at automatic differentiation. Why do we use automatic differentiation? We need to use automatic differentiation because in an automatic differentiation backprop depends on differentiation and if you have millions of weights we're going to have a problem here to try to do it anywhere else other than automatic. Why do we need differentiation? We need it in gradient descent and we need it in the chain rule in order to update our weights. Our options include, as you can see, manual differentiation. Well, that's not possible when you have millions of weights. Uh, symbolic differentiation is based on trees and the expressions can get very complicated. Finally, numerical differentiation is possible, but it's subject to truncation error and numerical error. So let's use automatic differentiation denoted by AD, which is exact to run off, round off and can even apply to each of side of discontinuous functions. AD depends on two pillars depends on dual numbers and computation graphs. Let's begin with dual numbers. First, the definition. Now, in order to get a feel for what's going on with dual numbers, we'll compare with complex numbers. So, in complex numbers, z equals a plus bj, and j is square root of minus 1, and actually represents a rotation of 90 degrees. For dual numbers, z equals a plus b epsilon, and epsilon is infinitesimal. Complex numbers can be represented as matrices, as shown, with the diagonal as a, the real part, and antisymmetrically b. So column 1 of z is a, b, column 2 is minus b, a, which is a 90 degree rotation of column 1. We can write A as diag A, and BJ is written as that anti-symmetric matrix as shown. For dual numbers, we have the same diagonal representation, but the, if you like, the imaginary, the epsilon part is represented by the matrix as shown. 0, 0, 0, and then B in the upper right-hand corner. For complex numbers, we know what the conjugate is, and zz star is the magnitude of the complex number squared. For dual numbers, z is a plus b epsilon, the conjugate is a minus b epsilon, and due to the properties of the dual numbers, zz star is now equal to a squared. Interpretation, finally, of a complex number matrix. The diagonal portion represents scaling, multiplying the diagonal by A, and the off-diagonal minus B, B represents rotation. In the case of dual numbers, we have the same interpretation of scaling on the diagonal, and B in the upper right-hand corner represents a shearing transformation. Now, let's start applying dual numbers. So first of all, the simplest thing to do is to look at epsilon squared, which turns out to be 0. Now, let's do some algebra. P of x equals a0 is a polynomial of degree capital N. Let's uh, compute P of x plus epsilon. If you do that, you have the first row, and then you can see that we just have two terms right here. We only have this second term. Why? Because all the other terms have epsilon squared and up, and those are all equal to zero. So what are we left with? Just the second term. So the first term with the a0 is p of x, and the second term is epsilon dp by dx. So it's the derivative just by evaluating in the manner of dual numbers. 
Let's look at some more complicated examples. Uh, we can have f of x equals sine x. Then you apply the addition formula as shown here, and you get sine x plus epsilon cosine x. Now, how did we get that? Well, here you can see we have cosine, which is something like 1 minus epsilon squared over 2 dot dot dot, and that's all equal to 0. So cosine epsilon is replaced by 1, and sine of epsilon is equal to epsilon minus epsilon cubed over 3 factorial, and these all disappear because epsilon squared is equal to 0, and so we get that result. Now, that could give us a hint as to what happens in general, and that's shown in the next line. f of x plus epsilon is given by this, and there shouldn't be an x in front here. That's a typograph. This should just be epsilon, not epsilon of x. So epsilon df by dx. Now, Using that, it's very easy, for example, to prove the product rule of differentiation, which I leave for you as an exercise. And a challenge exercise is to apply it to the derivative of the composite function. So remember, what you have to do is look at the inner part, which is g of x, and we'd replace g of x goes to g of x plus epsilon. We expand this and then expand the function of this. To get the final result, the first term will be f of g of x and the second term will be the chain rule term. Now, what we've done so far is dual numbers. We want to go forward now to computational graphs you can see on the right. And in order to do computational graphs, we'll just use an example. So I'm going to draw a computational graph. And so we'll start with one number here. So here's my computational graph. And we'll go over here and we'll have a, an addition of x plus y, and we'll call this t. So t equals x plus y. So that's one side. Then to make it interesting, we'll have multiplication here, and we'll call that u equals xy. Now, we're going to take u and stuff it into a cosine, and that's v equals cosine u. And now we're going to create our final output w, and w is equal to a product of t and v. So t is going up to here. And we're feeding the function, the value y up to here. So that's our computational graph. Now, let's put in some numbers. So let's put in x equal 1 and y equals 2. Then t is equal to 3. And now over here we have 1 times 2, so u is equal to 2. And then that's fed in here, so v equals cosine of 2. And now the product of t and v, so that's equal to 3 cosine of 2. So that's what we mean by the forward pass. We're bubbling through our network all the way to the end. You could think of these as input nodes, and this is the cost function. Now what we want to do is we want to go backwards. So when we want to go backwards, we really want to compute w the derivative of w when you change y a little bit, or the derivative of w when you change x a little bit, and all the intermediate values are going to change. 
So let's, let's set this out, and then it'd be an exercise for you to plug in the numbers. So for example, let's do x dash. x dash is defined to be dw by dx. So there's a flow here through t, and there's a flow of x through this branch. So we use the chain rule, dw, dt, dt, dx. That's from the left branch plus dw. Now we go all the way back, dw, dv. So we're going this way, then dv du, so we go from here to here, and then finally du dx. So we have three derivatives. This one got a little moved over here, but that's u, du dx. So dw dv, dv du, du dx. dw dv, dv du, du dx. And you can substitute in all the values that we have computed. So for example, what is dw dt? Well, that's v, and we know what v is, cosine 2, and so on. So similarly, we can do y dash, t dash, u dash, v dash, and also a w dash. w dash is really easy. W dash is equal to dw dw, which is equal to 1. Now, when we, when we write down these values with all the substitutions, we can actually set it up as a triangular matrix equation. And we'll show this in more detail in an upcoming video where we have a more complex graph to go through, and we'll go through it backwards. But this is the essence of the back propagation. As we go forward, we have all these intermediate values, most of which we can reuse. We'll have to take dv by du, so that's minus sign. That's the only real new value we'll have to compute. So you can see that there's a cost saving of going backwards this way rather than trying to write explicitly what W is in terms of X and Y and differentiating.